Enfold Proactive Health Trust, Creating Safe Spaces, presents Demystifying Sexuality, a video series. How toxic masculinity and femininity invade our lives and what we can do about it. Presented by Mahesh Natarajan, Counselor at InnerSight Bengaluru. Dr. Ardo Nister Lingdo, Assistant Professor, School of Social Work and Associate Dean Academics, Martin Luther Christian University, Shillong. I'm Mahesh Natarajan. I'm a cisgendered man. And uh, cisgendered means that uh, I was assigned male at birth and I'm comfortable with my gender as a man and can continue to identify as male. But then what does being male really mean? How did I know what it was to be a man? Was it something inbuilt or is it something that I learned? Was I this kind of a man when I was, uh, say, an infant of three months or six months? How about when I was two years old or eight years old? or a 20-year-old living in a hostel full of other men? Or is it now that as I am a man in my late 40s? When I think about it, uh, my ideas of maleness is something that I have learned, unlearned and relearned over and over throughout my life. When I was a young child of two or three years old, I really did not differentiate between items of clothing or uh, uh, anything at all. I would be as comfortable in shorts and skirts or even no clothing uh, whatsoever. And it would be perfectly fine. I didn't mind it. Nobody else uh, minded it around me. I cried when I wanted to whined and fought and screamed and smiled and laughed and showed my emotions as and when needed without anybody kind of uh, actually telling me this is okay or not okay. I remember that time. It seemed very much natural. And yet as I grew up, somehow I let go of so much. I was not wearing skirts or bangles anymore and certainly no flowers by the time I was six years old. By the time I was 12, I wouldn't cry as much. I wouldn't cry when I was disappointed or angry. And even when I was terribly sad, I would grow, uh, go to some place where I could be alone and cry there. I was walking in a certain way, holding my shoulders up in a certain way, looking in a certain way. I had started to conform to the norms I saw around me. A lot of it was easy for me, but some of it was just not happening easily. I have pictures from college and even later on when all the boys around me were striking very bodybuilder type macho poses. I did as well, only that my poses were a little bit different and it was less typically masculine. There's a picture of me jumping with my buddies uh, in a, uh, like in, in the Hindi movie Dil Chata Hai. The difference is quite stark. I was certainly not as masculine as the others were. It would have not mattered much at all if people didn't really kind of snigger or laugh at those pictures or in the, in the real life at, as it is. If people didn't mock me, it wouldn't have stressed me at all. But since there was all that mocking, it made me want to try and uh, conform to what was expected from me. And when I couldn't, it caused me to try and avoid such exposure. I don't think I ever jumped again for a picture like that uh, in my adulthood. Who wants to be mocked, right? My personal examples are but the lightest shade of how these ideas of masculinity or femininity can get quite toxic. So what is toxic masculinity? Before we get there, let's kind of explore a little bit of uh, how we even learn these things. As a culture, human beings learn by observing, reflecting and performing. As babies, this is absolutely critical for us to become a, a, a human being in our child's development. This is something which is absolutely critical. We see that in how babies respond to peekaboo games and how adults and babies reflect each other's ex uh, uh, expressions and uh, bond over it. In the 1970s, there was a famous psychological experiment called the still face experiment, where it was shown that we learn everything by observing and imitating and how we get very stressed if we don't uh, get positive feedback for our actions and how we get really anxious if we have negative reactions. The experiment went like this. There's a baby and a caretaker playing together and they're very involved in whatever games that they're playing. The baby does something and the uh, caretaker is reflecting upon that curious and uh, showing similar kind of facial expressions and the baby kind of gurgles and interacts with them and everything is as normally you would expect. And then on cue, what happens is that the adult then kind of lay as a still face, doesn't show any expression at all even as the child is trying to play with them. What happens is that the child then really gets anxious, some start crying, some start fighting, some just become absolutely still themselves, completely confused because they are not sure what to do. That kind of reflects about how we also learn gender roles. 
and what it means to be masculine or similar as uh, feminine this is in a very similar way that we learn by behaving as we would as we normally would then observing the reactions to it from our family and from the society around us and then trying hard to be in a certain way that uh, where we would not necessarily uh, be dis uh, discarded or excluded we try and be as acceptable or uh, try and do things what are even aspirational for our gender we look to our role, uh, role models on how we are supposed to be or we look upon the role models that are thrust upon us it's either the family or society and even popular culture or even advertisements like if you see an advertisement for a bike thundering down a road with a studly person on it with women spooning and uh, swooning around that person and uh, with the slogan a man's bike then we certainly associate that masculinity as what is desirable many of us might uh, want that kind of a bike or uh, look like that and wear that kind of a jacket or sunglasses or whatever similarly if a coy fair fresh faced woman is uh, uh, being shown cooking in the kitchen and feeding appreciative male members and at the end of it she holds up a pressure cooker and says a perfect woman that kind of underlines uh, what is supposed to be feminine for many of us the pressure to conform is both something internal and external we try and be the most preferred type of whatever gender we identify with with the hope of getting the approval of our society much like the babies with the immediate caregivers in that still face experiment we were talking about just as the still faced uh, uh, caregiver confuses the child uh, what happens is that if we don't actually get the approval that we want for our gender expression it confuses us the pressures of society disapproving peers and others can confuse the individual's intrinsic gender expression and uh, denying a wholly individual way of expression and pushing for conformity to a very specific type of uh, gender expression it gets toxic when not only is the individual expression controlled but also there are certain socially harmful traits are celebrated like aggression and emotional unavailability for masculinity is celebrated as what is the ideal of being masculine and similarly if on the other side uh, subservience and uh, beauty is uh, celebrated for femininity uh, instead of other traits it is toxic masculinity when a certain power structure is accepted if we say that okay males are the first gender females are the second gender and others are third gender or not even considered then it sets up a certain kind of so social ordinality where it then becomes toxic even within that male as first gender if we say there's an alpha male which is celebrated then the culture then sets out men who are not alpha to be weaker or undeserving of uh, adulation or acceptance and that has brought the violence of the male who then wants to take on this alpha role all the time but cannot or uh, uh, do not uh, actually really in intrinsically behave in that way then it sets up a fury of that involuntary uh, uh, celebrates the incels and the others who then are constantly striving to be this alpha male and violence becomes something which is uh, established as a norm misogyny homophobia and transphobia arise from such toxic ideas of power and aggression based masculinity even what could have been healthier signs of uh, uh, masculinity such as protection gets toxic and gets corrupted into dominance and subjugation and violence in the process what happens is uh, for those for whom certain behaviors seen as masculine are not easy uh, or they cannot pass as these uh, alpha men or it's not just possible for them uh, because how they identify as their gender they then get excluded from all these things that are identified as male or male male oriented so some sports and social events are uh, places that uh, people get excluded from because they're not male enough that they're not man enough and uh, that's the least of it at the worst what happens is that uh, it becomes a very tough place to live if you are gender non conforming or if you are male identified at birth but uh, you don't necessarily uh, behave in that uh, uh, male way that the society wants you to behave such people the transgender people or gender non conforming people or just people who are not as masculine as the world uh, needs them to be uh, then become uh, targets of violence by uber macho groups uh, who may be seeing these people as a, a threat to masculine power in general or a social order or even their own individual masculinity so toxic masculinity leads not only to gender violence aggression and brutality but it's also denial of so called feminine feminine traits for men 
right? And then it isolates us from experiencing caring and nurturing roles. Uh, it uh, isolates uh, uh, people from uh, enjoying community uh, spaces. It denies themselves active parenting, denies self-care for their own bodies other than just muscling up or uh, uh, behaving in a certain kind of a, a masculine way. It negates enjoyment of emotional events and so on. So at its very heart, toxic masculinity is toxic to those who strive to live by its ideals, denying themselves emotional care, which I guess is also why we see so many more men are killing themselves than women and so many more in men involved in violent events like homicide. And certainly a lot of the wars and conflict are uh, uh, initiated by and uh, held by men. And uh, that's the danger of toxic masculinity. Now, when we talk about your toxic masculinity, a uh, uh, question rises, uh, is there such a thing as toxic femininity? The thing is, if we were in the 1950s or earlier, we might not even have talked about these ideas of toxic masculinity, let alone toxic any other gender role, right? Uh, it was always like kind of quite ordained as uh, this is male, this is female, blah, blah, blah. It was nothing very uh, different at all. But with the increasing assertion of gender equality and feminism, uh, what happened is this: those committed to an idea of patriarchal worldview, that's already the people who are on top and who are benefiting from this uh, patriarchal viewpoint, then sees, uh, see all this as a feminine, femininization of masculinity and uh, that men are being emasculated. And uh, then there's a counter push for creating real men. And uh, that results in, again, a polarization of gender roles with these real men as the big bell muscle farmers and soldiers who are the providers and protectors. And uh, then these polarized ideas of masculinity did not just result in uh, toxic masculinity where power, violence, and domination and being alpha came through, but also the mirror image of a certain kind of toxic femininity where uh, females who wholly accepted this patriarchal view of genders bought into the gender view and internalized it. So toxic femininity is the mirror image of toxic masculinity, focusing and forcing only a certain set of traits as feminine and denying all other possibilities of uh, experience and expression uh, for uh, women. Uh, toxic femininity is acceptance of male as the dominant uh, uh, gender and the denial of gender equality for all others. So those who have internalized toxic femininity then see themselves as second class citizens designed to serve men and their needs and uh, set aside their own wishes and desires or even potential just to be able to kind of like fulfill their uh, male overlords' wishes and uh, see their role as limited to caretaking and child care, rearing and housekeeping and being objects for male pleasure and then just are going to look a certain way and behave in a certain way because uh, that's the role that then that, that is internalized. So they would limit their own potential, not seeking to study or work in the way that uh, they have the most aptitude for, but choose to kind of like downplay their intelligence, downplay their financial abilities or career goals, uh, and even might at the, at the worst of it, hold shame in their own gender or sexuality, or uh, take pride only in a certain way of being in their gender or uh, sexuality. Uh, they, they hold virginity as precious or uh, uh, they even tolerate abuse in relationships just to kind of like stay with the, uh, some uh, male figure as, as a dominant figure. And uh, when even after all this, there is uh, not happiness. Uh, at the worst of it, toxic femininity leads to people blaming themselves uh, for not being good enough. That uh, They blame themselves that they need to work towards greater perfection of uh, uh, being this kind of a woman and uh, then leads into trying to be even more submissive or even more subservient to the men in their lives. So in that sense, toxic femininity is a capitulation to patriarchy and toxic masculinity. It's a surrender of individuality. The question then to ask is uh, either this toxic masculinity and femininity, would it even exist if patriarchal notions of gender ordinality and uh, this defining of traits as male or female uh, and how social spaces are uh, gendered and discriminating, if these didn't exist, would we have a toxic uh, masculinity or femininity at all? Uh, what's going on there? See, the thing is that uh, when, when we look at it, genders are not the issue. Gender-based discrimination is the issue. So when we challenge toxic masculinity and toxic femininity, we are calling both out as products of patriarchy. 
the thing is, when people steeped in patriarchal perspectives of the world, then see it as if this is a challenge to gender itself, or use that as an argument to try and protect themselves and keep the existing social order. Many bristle against it, saying that this is a secret agenda of certain kinds of people, especially like LGBTQ people, or anarchists, or communists, or uh, atheists, and others, and uh, th that this is all designed to dismantle the world order. And often they claim that patriarchy is ordained by God himself, or uh, other supernatural entities, and that the aim of feminism and uh, liberalism is to emasculate males and to stop women from producing children and therefore destroying the human species altogether. Such assertions are far from the truth, obviously, and uh, one could argue that it is patriarchy lashing out against the increasing awareness that patriarchy doesn't work for everybody. It works only for the people on the top and everybody else is uh, in a subservient space to that, uh, uh, that social order. Like within gay men, for example, uh, the more feminine of them, the more fem men routinely express uh, uh, like, uh, experiences of uh, discrimination. Uh, there is gendered violence and exclusion uh, in, in social spaces and everywhere else. In, uh, in dating uh, systems in designed for gay men, uh, you see these tags of mask for mask, uh, mask or no fem and other such tags as very, very common. So the term femphobia within the gay communities is specifically used to denote uh, such violence directed at fem people uh, who uh, uh, sometimes also react to violence on themselves because uh, they see so much hate directed at them. Toxic masculinity does not have a particular cultural or political space. It's not the exclusive uh, territory of uh, heterosexual cisgendered men alone, and certainly not just about white Americans or uh, a certain kind of caste or community. It is fairly pervasive, and we see uh, toxic masculinity in all sorts of social groups, from white Americans to Adivasis to uh, uh, even Aust Australian Aborigines, uh, you would see it across classes, castes and communities. Toxic masculinity is very much uh, uh, the uh, uh, problem that we have to face. So in any case, the fight is uh, against toxic masculinity. It's not a fight against gender at all, or even if it's not a call for a gender-free world. Gender is a reality. Uh, gender expression is a reality. People do and will identify as a particular gender, want to express that gender in a way that fits them. So it is likely to continue to mean something specific to each of us. Our gender is a big part of our identity. All that we are doing by calling out toxic masculinity is to seek uh, uh, a liberation of gender from the shackles of patriarchy. We want to just recognize that all human traits are available for every gender that there is no human behavior which is the exclusive province of any particular gender. Why we are doing this is because there's a personal cost for each and every one of us because of toxic masculinity. Living in a largely patriarchal world, it is no surprise that each of us have internalized these ideas of what is supposed to be feminine and masculine, and uh, if not to uh, the greatest extent, at least to some degree. For many of us, it just informs us, uh, the social orders that we see, just informs us as to how different genders are perceived and even allows for a certain sense of belonging. That when I say I'm a cisgendered man, there's a sense of comfort saying, yeah, this is where I belong, this is how I identify myself. And there's a sense of knowing one, uh, one's place in the world, so to say. Not as much that if there is not much of dissonance between how we see ourselves and what the world uh, feels uh, uh, that this gender ought to be, absolutely no problem at all. The thing is that for those who don't fit the bill, uh, the dissonance is painful. So if I feel a certain way and the world kind of like mocks it or uh, makes it unsafe for me to be male in a certain way, it is a, a source of pain for me. We try to defend against this pain by denying who we are or trying to be uber masculine or bullying others or uh, uh, just avoiding spaces or avoiding places that uh, we could actually have or wish to access, whether it be sport or uh, social venues or uh, relationships. And uh, uh, that is the cost that we, uh, we end up paying. And uh, so uh, for people who are vulnerable, this is the cost and uh, sometimes it's much worse than this as well. So each of us pays a personal price and we are each diminished by toxic masculinity and that is something for us to be aware of and to work against. I invite Adonister to talk about the gender roles in the Khasi tribe. I am Dr. Adonister Lingna, Associate Dean Academics and Assistant Professor of the School of Social Work, Martin Luther Christian University. I belong to the Khasi tribe from Meghalaya, which is a matrilineal community. The Khasi tribe is mostly misunderstood to be a matriarchal community, 
but in fact the Khasi tribe from Meghalaya belongs mostly to the matrilineal community. There is a huge difference between matriarchal communities and matrilineal communities. Matriarchal is where women have the ultimate power over men. In the Khasi community, though most of the wealth and the ancestral property is inherited by the youngest daughter. However, the role that she plays as the youngest daughter is mostly as a custodian to the ancestral property. But it is the maternal uncle who manages all the ancestral property on her behalf. The institution of the youngest daughter's home plays a very, very important role in the Khasi community. The youngest daughter's home is a safe sanctuary for all members of the family, married or unmarried. In cases of any distress strikes their life, all members of the family can return to the youngest home. Traditionally, the youngest daughter has the financial responsibility to take care of the welfare of the family especially her parents in their old age, and ensuring proper religious rites and ceremonies at the appropriate occasion. This should never be confused with the term matriarchal, where women have the overall control in the society. In the Khasi society, there is no evidence to state that or to show that women are in control of everything in the society. It may be noted that in the Khasi matrilineal system, the maternal uncle plays a very important role in all cultural and religious practices of the family and the clan. The political and the administrative rights are all under the maternal uncle. However, the term matrilineal simply means that the lineage and the property is being passed down through a female line. This video is part of a series of videos and learning content aimed at addressing gender-based violence. These videos provide practitioner perspectives by professionals and experts in the field. We hope these videos generate further discussions with peers, family members and teachers, encourage curiosity and seed further research ideas in these domains. We gratefully acknowledge the following for their support. Gaurav Krishna, Keshav Rajendran, Ishwar Shankar, Mohan Ram, Clockwork Captions, Enfold Consultants, Ford Foundation. The copyright and other intellectual property rights in respect of this video belong exclusively to Enfold Proactive Health Trust, Enfold. Enfold licenses this video under the terms of Creative Commons License, CC BY-NC-ND 4.0, the details of which can be found at https colon slash slash creativecommonslicense.org slash licenses slash by hyphen nc hyphen nd slash 4.0 slash any use or reproduction of this video contrary to or in violation of the terms of the aforesaid creative commons license will be illegal and enfold reserves the right to take suitable action in respect thereof enfold also reserves the right to modify terminate or revoke the license granted as aforesaid or otherwise exercise any and all rights in respect of its intellectual property without further notice and the same shall be binding on the licensee or user or reader thereof. June 2021 Enfold Proactive Health Trust www.enfoldindia.org Contact info at enfoldindia.org plus 91-99-000 94251 www.enfoldindia.org